Hello and welcome to the Accent Podcast, where I, Aznar Midov, interview accomplished entrepreneurs and business leaders about their personal and professional journeys. In this episode, I sat down with Keith Tier, the executive chairman of ADV. Over his career, Keith has built numerous companies, including EasyNet and Real Names, each valued in over $1 billion. He was also a co-founder of Archimedes Ventures that has built a famous block tech crunch. We covered many subjects, from class conscious United Kingdom to blockchain, from bootstrapped companies to venture capital trends, from Karl Marx to a rapper Lil Backwood, and from Keith childhood to his advice to young people. Enjoy. Keith, thank you very much for being on the podcast. You're welcome. You've been involved in quite a few ventures over your lifetime, and I'm not sure how we're going to fit everything in one episode. Uh, but you're currently uh, executive chairman of Accelerated Digital Ventures, right? Correct. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the, the firm and what you guys do. Uh, well, we call it ADV for short. Um, ADV is, firstly, it's a UK-specific venture fund. Um, that said, um, it's a quite unusual fund. Uh, the first thing is um, it isn't structured economically in the way a fund is structured. You know, normal venture funds, they have um, investors who give them money to invest They invested over five years. They return the investors' money plus about 10%. And after that, they share the profit with the investors 80-20. That's a normal fund. One of the drawbacks of a normal fund is it only invests for three to five years and it has to exit within 10. So there's enormous pressure on it to get the companies sold or IPO within a period of time. So we don't like that. Um, ADV is, is, is made up of people who've been founders of companies and we know that the pace of a company is something you can't determine in advance so um, you know having to start to look for an exit after five years is unnatural um, so we set up ADV not as a fund but as a company mm -hmm. so it's a company with shareholders they they gave us money we gave them shares in ADV that means we don't have to give them their money back So you have a permanent capital, basically. We have permanent capital, um, it's, and, and it's evergreen. So if we make good investments and we get exits, we keep the money to reinvest in the next uh, companies. So we don't have to go and keep raising funds time after time. So that was the original idea. The, the second thing about ADV is it came out of my experience here in Silicon Valley, and my co-founders all had similar experiences in the UK, which is that venture capital in the last, well, really since the bubble uh, in 2000, venture capital has structurally changed. So it used to be the case that you could um, raise a, a, you know, three to five million dollar first round and be given a couple of years to build something impressive um, with a strong team and with a big idea, with a big outcome in mind. Um, but after the bubble burst, venture capital basically disappeared from Silicon Valley between 2000 and 2005. There was more or less no venture capital in Silicon Valley or anywhere else in the world for that matter. So when Web 2.0 uh, started around 2005, and there were a new crop of companies, companies like, um, for example, YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't get funding because there, were, there was no venture capital. So a new class of investor came into being, which were super angels, accelerators, incubators. So between 2005 and 2008, there was a whole new class of investor doing early stage investing. Today, looking forward, you know, rolling the clock forward, there's about 450 what are now called micro funds in the Silicon Valley. A micro fund is a fund that manages less than $100 million. 450 of them. And they are doing all of the early stage investing. Uh, and they didn't exist until 2005 through 8. And most of them didn't even exist then. 2010, 2012, um, some of them came into being. So those people do seed investing, seed entry, uh, along with accelerators like Y Combinator, 500 startups. And, um, you know, you'd think that was a good thing, except for the number of companies they fund is 10 times bigger than in 2005, roughly 4,000 deals a year today. And um, about 95% of those companies die. And the reason they die is there's no venture capital. 
in the middle between between that seed stage and the growth stage. There's no venture capital, very small anyway. So ADV's second reason for being is to try to fill the gap between the seed stage and the growth stage of investing so that companies can survive and get across the middle. So what is it? Is it a serious AB or what, what are we late, talking about? Late seed, late. Um, a, and a rounds, B rounds, and maybe even a little bit of C rounds. But ADV actually invests both in, we, we invest in seed funds as well. So we give the seed funds money both as an LP and um, to help them do their pro rata in the companies that succeed. And that means the seed funds can go further and deeper into the life of the company. Uh, so we have some money for investing through funds in partnership with funds, um, co-investing sometimes. And then we have some funds which are direct investing, which typically go later into the companies. So basically it's like a Berkshire Hathaway partially investing in companies, partially giving money to funds. Yep. And the goal is to, you know, put a small amount of our capital at risk very early by investing through the funds. Mm -hmm. But most of our capital goes into the companies that emerge out of the funds as winners. So you could also think of it as a very efficient filter on uh, when there's 4,000 deals and you know there's only going to be 20 winners. It's a very efficient mechanism for putting most of your money into those 20 winners. Uh, but you probably own a little piece of all, all the companies in all the portfolios of the funds that we're in. As I understand, you are not publicly traded, right? No, we're, a, pri it... we're a private company and we only have two shareholders. Okay, good. Uh, we have um, one of the world's biggest life insurance companies. It's called Legal and General. Mm -hmm. They manage a trillion pounds of pension fund money. Um, so they're huge. They are one shareholder. And the second is a British Fidelity style fund. Um, it's a publicly traded fund um, that consumers can invest through into, into like mutual funds. It's called Woodford Investment Management. Mm -hmm. The two of those are the only two shareholders plus the, 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 the management team. And those two can't withdraw? No. Okay. No. They're locked. Good. No, no, they're, they're in and, they're, you know, they're not just locked, but they're, they're believers in the strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, they helped us construct the strategy. We, we're, we're now, um, you could think of it that they gave us our seed money. Our seed money was 150 million pounds um, uh, maximum. In fact, in practice, it's a little bit less than that. And uh, we've invested it to prove the concept. We're now uh, ready to... Um, so, it, so if I tell you that just in the UK alone, the seed funds that we partner with, which is about 20 seed funds, collectively have a need for about 1.6 billion pounds of co-invest and pro rata for the next three years. And that's kind of like a pipeline. It's named companies with specific trajectories. Our goal is to fund as much of that as we can, pro probably realistically about half of it. Mm. Um, in, through various products that we partner with the seed funds on. Do you raise more capital or are you capped? No, we, 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 well, now that we've got the company set up, now we can raise capital for some traditional funds uh -huh. that will, will still supply this need. Uh, based on the, your focus, what kind of companies are you uh, targeting? Um, well, uh, sector-wise, uh, we, we're called Accelerated Digital Ventures for a reason. We do digital tech. Mm -hmm. So we don't do life sciences, for example, uh, or medical, um, unless it's digital. Digital tech is largely software. Sometimes it involves hardware. We've done, made a few investments that involve hardware. Um, it's a lot of marketplaces. For example, we just invested in a company called EV Easy, which is an electronic vehicle service that lets you uh, use a car without buying it and then drop it off when, and change it for another one whenever you want. Uh, and that there's a lot of hardware involved in that, cars. Um, Clearly. But, but it's basically a software platform and a logistics platform before it's anything else. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we, you know, we're very frustrated by the fact that startups are largely getting miseducated today. They're being encouraged to do three-month incubations or accelerators and um, do a demo day and be measured by their short, early traction. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, from the point of view of long-term innovation, that doesn't make any sense. 
it's like I'm a football fan, British version of football. <laughs> you know, if Manchester United is winning 1-0 and it's in the fifth minute of a 90-minute game, it doesn't really tell me anything about who's going to win. And so I, I find traction or momentum investing really undermines what a venture investor should be doing, which is looking for long-term transformational ideas and teams that have a lot of value uh, due to the disruption that they'll cause. So alongside the sector, digital tech, we, we're really looking for, for companies that are redefining something big. And how do they find you and how you, do you find them? Is it two-way street? Um, well, we, we're a kind of a hybrid fund in that we, as I said, invest a lot through partnerships. The 20 top seed entry funds in the UK are our partners. So they do a lot of the finding and they're good at it. They have a track record. Uh, we supply capital as their winning companies emerge and they're doing the picking. So we don't really think of ourselves as really great pickers. That said, we, we're software people. My co-founder, Lee Strafford, built Plusnet, which is a software ISP in the UK that British Telecom acquired. I've built a lot of software companies in my time. Michael Dimelo, uh, who's part of the founding team, he ran mergers and acquisitions at Arm, which SoftBank just acquired for £34 billion. Pounds. Oh, nice. Uh, dollars, actually, I think. Um, and David Carr, who's the fourth of the founding exec team, uh, ran AOL broadband in Europe from like 100 customers to a million customers. So we're all, we're all operators. What it means is that we believe that software can automate almost anything. So we've um, built something called Venture Market. It's at venturemarket.org. And startups apply for funding through Venture Market. We've got 13 uh, fun firms on Venture Market right now. Collectively, they manage close to a billion pounds. And um, every fund can see every application and do their own unique thing with that company. So that's a software platform to um, serve the seed entry stage of venture. Therefore, we don't need the company to be introduced to us. We don't need, you know, the, the kind of the um, artisan style of venture capital, like where people will say, well, I'm, I'm really clever and I'm really good at picking and but it's really hard to get to see me. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, we don't do that. And your role as uh, executive chairman, what's what does it include? What's your day to day? Well, there's there's two words there, and they each have a meaning. So, chairman, uh, there's a board of directors, and mm -hmm. and I'm the chairman of the board of directors, which means I convene the board meetings, and um, in that context, your uh, the management team is is in a way reporting through the board to the shareholders. Um, so that's, um, there's a kind of a governance element to that. But the word executive means that I'm a full-time member of the exec team as well. So I, so I kind of wear two hats. Uh, through, th between board meetings, I'm working with Lee Strafford, the CEO, David Carr, Mike Dimelo, and the rest of the team. There's 15 of us in the team, uh, just as a, a regular member of, of, of the exec. In that role, I do a lot of external storytelling fundraising, working with our CEOs of the companies we've invested in to help them figure out their plans. So all kinds of stuff. And you're known as a blockchain and crypto asset enthusiast. What has attracted you to that field? Well, I, I think of blockchain as a foundational technology in the same way that the internet was, in the same way that, and by the internet, I mean TCP IP, the protocol, in the same way that the web was, by which I mean HTTP, and um, in the same way that mobile is and the cloud is, foundational means the future will be built on top of it. So blockchain is a foundational technology. It is not a thing in itself, although many people try to pretend it is. Blockchain is not a thing in itself. What is it really? It's a database um, that's capable of holding a ledger Uh, and uh, there's no central owner of the records, but it's just a database. It's interesting because it, you can build protocols on it. Um, so a protocol is a, a software layer that defines a set of behaviors that can be more or less universal. For example, payments could be a protocol. 
Um, and so to me, blockchain goes together with protocols. That's one of the reasons Ethereum is so important because it has a programming language built in. But you can build in any programming language on top of the Bitcoin blockchain as well. And then the third thing is there's something unique about it, which is um, every previous protocol, the inventors did, did not get rewarded for, for inventing it. So, you know, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn invented TCP IP, but they didn't get rich because you could use TCP IP without paying them. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee invented HTTP, and he didn't get rich because you could use it without paying him. The nice thing about blockchain is if you use the protocol, you have to pay in token appropriate to the blockchain you're using. And so the underlying creators and service providers in, get paid through the use. So the network effect, which we're all familiar with when when, when things get bigger and bigger and bigger due to a network effect, will result in uh, rewards flowing through to the people providing the services or who invented the blockchain. Um, think of it as distributed reward system. So actually, I think blockchain without crypto makes no sense. It's, it's just a database. And by the way, it's a very poor database. Mm. Uh, but blockchain with crypto is a new way of rewarding the people who will provide services to everybody else. And that's what makes it really interesting. And it means any protocol that catches on, like, um, you know, Filecoin is trying to build a protocol for storing files. Any protocol that catches on, the founders will be richly rewarded through the use of the protocol. That's very unique. And it means the foundational layer of the next generation of the internet is very different to the previous uh, and is going to be um, adopted simply because you can make money by being part of it. And that wasn't always true. With It was almost never true with previous eras. How do you think the price drop of all the cryptocurrencies affect this uh, progress? Is it stopping it or people reconsidering it? Well, I, th I think what it does is it stops a false direction. It doesn't stop the blockchain but it stops the speculative altcoin base uh, application layer. Um, so, so, you know, if you, if you think of the internet, the internet value dropped by 96% in the year 2000, which is almost exactly what's happened with crypto. But 96% drop in the internet still meant it was a multi-billion dollar business. Um, and between 2000 and 2019, it's not only recovered those losses, but now is two or three X bigger than it was then. Well, to me, blockchain is, because it's foundational, it doesn't go away. And the, what has dropped is the valuation that was largely driven by speculation. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin is still worth $3,500. Um, and if you look at the low point of Bitcoin annually, three years ago, it was $70. Mm. A year ago, it was the low point was uh, two years ago, sorry, $700. Uh, a year ago, the low point was $3,200. And this year, let's see what the low point is. But if you measure the growth by the low point, it's a massive upward curve. Uh, and so, you know, of course, it went much higher for about three months. I don't think that's very relevant to the long term. I've seen quite a few uh, debates on both sides and uh, the proponents basically give your uh, explanation what the benefits, while opponents, uh, one of the argument they bring is show us the actual uh, result of blockchain. What mm -hmm. do you see ha has happened and well, the way, the way to think of it is, uh, the right way to ask the question is uh, the same way that people asked about, let's say, video. Mm -hmm. So when I first met Chad Hurley, when we, we were doing TechCrunch in 2005, and he was pitching YouTube, the percentage of packets on the internet that were video-based was a single-digit percent. And uh, now video accounts for, I don't know, 80% of all internet packets are video. Um, well, so if you ask the question, um, 
what, how many packets on the internet are blockchain related, are, are, are reading and writing data based on blockchain? It's massively more than it was last year, but it's still single digit percent. What's it going to get to 10 years from now? Is it going to be 50%? Is it going to be 80%? Is it going to be 90%? And um, I think it's going to be a big number. So the value of a network is related to its use. You know, so the value of video today on the internet is very high. The value of blockchain is relatively low because it's, it's not well used yet. What will make it used? Well, what will make it used is protocols that make sense. So let's just make something up and let's imagine the future. Let's imagine that instead of um, giving videos to Netflix so that we can subscribe to it and pay Netflix a fee, let's say instead of doing that, the people who make the videos, the creative talent, just submit the videos to a payment network using the blockchain that also has their rights enshrined in it and that we can stream that video. But when we do, we pay the creators. There's no middleman anymore. That's not such a wild idea. That probably would be very, very beneficial to the creators. The, uh, the reduction in middlemen is a, a human good because middlemen take value away from the creator and the consumer. And so if you can get rid of middlemen, it's good for everyone except the middlemen. So you can imagine um, all video being streamed with blockchain as the core technology doing the payments and the IP rights. Uh, there'd still be some middlemen, but they'd be much thinner. Um, same with music. Uh, you know, what, what, why wouldn't an artist just publish their music and allow you to stream it? And when you do, they get paid with as little in between the listener and the creator as possible. Blockchain would allow that. So the, the, these are just simple protocols that if built and if adopted would change the economics of everything. Uh, but would also mean that most packets d- delivered across the internet would be blockchain-based. And so I think now we're at the stage where it's up to product creators and visionaries to create these products, um, and it will be the next generation of the cloud. So it's more about timing, in your opinion, versus the actual technology. It's about timing. No, think about the first websites. You're yeah, probably too young, but I'm not. I'm not. When I opened Siberia Cafe in 1994, which was the internet cafe in London, And people came to look at the internet because they were kind of in awe that this thing existed. The web pages were terrible. <laughs> I mean, like way, Craigslist? <laughs> way worse than the worst blockchain today. Uh, so things being terrible doesn't mean they're not relevant. It just means it's the first phase. Understand. So Keith, we're going to be talking about your business ventures and what you've done in the different industries. But prior to that, I'd like to learn more about you as a person. And the way I'm thinking of doing it is actually going chronologically from the very beginning to the present day. What do you think? Sure. So where were you born and grew up? Uh, I was born in a, a small town in the northeast of England called Scarborough. So Scarborough is about 50,000 people. It's a seaside town with a, a fishing harbor and two bays and a Roman castle. And is well known because Charlotte Bronte, the author, is buried in a church there. Uh, so I was born in Scarborough, working class. Um, in, in England, you know which class you're in very early in life. Um, it's, it's a very class-conscious country. Early. Um, and uh, so I was born working class. I was the oldest kid of five brothers and a sister um, and a half-brother. Actually, my mother had a child before me. Um, that she lost contact with. That's a long story, but um, she wasn't allowed contact with that child when she was 17 at that time. And, um, and so, you know, if you really say it, six brothers and, and one sister, two of the brothers uh, died. Um, I'm sorry. One shortly after birth and then one when he was 37. So, so today uh, I have a half brother, two brothers and a sister surviving big family i'm, I'm assuming if, if there are so many of you one of you were a troublemaker was it you or was... no i was the goody goody <laughs> um 
you know, my mom, my mom kicked out, kicks my dad out when I was 15. My dad worked for the British Secret Service and he was a heavy drinker and, um, uh, alcoholic really and, uh, violent. Mm -hmm. So my mother kicked him out. And so from the age of 15 to 18, um, I was kind of, she, she went to work. She used to go to work at 10 PM and come home at 6 AM. So, uh, I was like the boss when she wasn't there. And I, so I had to cook, I had to clean, uh, I had to learn to sew, uh, all kinds of stuff. So I was, I was the goody goody kind of proxy dad to the rest. So you saw you were raising them. Yeah. Got it. Since you grew up primarily with her, right? Yeah. You, you, yeah. Was she the one who influenced you the most or? Well, she, she's a very strong woman. Mm -hmm. So she made me very aware of, um, the role of women. So I, from very early on, I was against sexism and, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't like hanging out in bars with my male friends. Mm -hmm. I bonded a lot more with women uh, than men. Um, so, and she was strong and she was caring and she had a very strong, almost, you know, almost a Protestant sense of right and wrong. I, I wasn't religious, but she was. And, um, so you grew up with a very strong sense of right and wrong and a very strong sense of, um, you have to apply yourself to, for things to happen. Um, but, but I'd say influence more came from the outside world. I, I, I was born in 54. By 1968, uh, I was 14. And that was the era of Vietnam War was about to happen. Uh, the British Army was going to Ireland. Um, immigrants were being targeted in the UK as bad. Mm -hmm. um, and um, coming from a working class background, I had a view of the world that it was unfair. Uh, if, you, if you're conscious and working class, you cannot believe the world is fair. It's, uh, it's unfair. Uh, as often when parents say that to children, you're right, it is unfair. So um, the second thing, once you realize it's unfair, is you want to change it. So it's unfair, but it doesn't mean it's right. So let's change it. So by the time I was um, in my late teens, I was uh, strongly critical of everything I saw around me that was bad, in my view, bad. Things like British col col colonialism. Um, Northern Ireland was very big in, in our world at that point. And to me, it made no sense that my country drew a line on another country and told people north of the line that they were part of us and south of the line that they were not when um, it was a separate country. Um, so you got this very strong sense of right and wrong and the need to change things. That probably was the biggest influence. So it was in your mid-teens. It's interesting. When I was in my mid-teens, I was playing video game. And you already were thinking that. I'm assuming that's why you chosen your sociology and political science major. I, I, I wanted to understand, um, well, the first thing is, you know, Brit Brit British society at that time made it very hard for a working class kid to go to university. It was quite unusual. Uh, they, 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 you did an exam at the age of 11, and the exam was called 11 plus. And if you failed the exam, you would go into the B stream, and the B stream, your education would stop after the age of 15. Mm. And you would be destined to go and work in a factory. Um, and I failed the 11 plus. I'm a kind of a, in America, they call it a young five. Uh, my birthday is August 27th and the cutoff date for school year is September 1st. So I was 10 when I took the 11 plus, not 11. And I was a borderline. And so the headmaster interviewed me uh, to determine whether I would pass or fail. And the only question in the interview was, what does your father do? Oh, and um, which is a loaded question, but even worse, because my father worked in the Secret Service, I really didn't know what he did. So I failed. And so they sent me to the B stream. Um, that was 1964. Uh, uh, that's the year that the first uh, Labour government was elected in the UK. Harold Wilson was the prime minister. And in the four years that I was in secondary school, he brought in um, a new exam at the age of 15. Uh, called the CSE, 
that allowed you to go back to the A stream if you got four A's, two of which had to be math and English. And I did do that. So I went back to the A stream. As soon as I showed up at the new school, they told me not to apply to university because it was ridiculous to imagine I could possibly do that. <laughs> so then I said, oh, well, you know, basically in that case, I'm going to apply to university. Uh, I, I didn't really have any plans to, but I was so angry being told I couldn't that I decided I would. And I eventually got into university and I, I, I passed with the best degree in my year and I went on to do a PhD. But it, but it was all, I actually was thrown out of my university in the first year as well and got back in. Um, so I was, I was a pretty fully baked rebel by then that didn't tolerate authority telling you you couldn't do things. So you were probably one of the first B streamers in the university. Is it the case? Probably, yeah. yeah. It would have been the first year that it would, it would be possible, yeah. I'm wondering how was it for you in that environment? Like you said that uh, the society is very uh, class-driven. Your peers, how did they react to the fact that you were there? I well, once you're in university, actually, it's remarkably declassed. Um, it's pretty much... Uh, everyone for themselves and there's no particular pigeonholing and a academic freedom is you know fairly deep in in western european culture so once you're in an academic institution um, you know you've just become another person and you're not really classified anymore and there's a lot of overseas students as well which helps um, mm. uh, who you can't classify and uh, I, w i went to the university of kent which is in canterbury And, um, no, it was great. And I, and, and I loved it from the first day and I, I was very opinionated and so made good friends with my lecturers in, in England, you do lectures and seminars. So you, you would go to a lecture with a couple hundred students on a Monday and then through the rest of the week, uh, broken down into groups of less than 10, you would meet with the lecturer for a seminar for an hour. And that was where they got to know you. So I, I actually got on very well with, with them and did, and, and enjoyed university a lot. Um, but still was a rebel. Like we organized, um, protests in my first year because overseas students were having their tuition fees raised higher than home students. So we supported the overseas students to be equal to the home students in terms of how much it cost. And, uh, that led to me getting thrown out actually. What? Yeah, you were clearly a rebel. <laughs> and then you, you said they took you back? What's yeah, that? they took... You know, they liked me. The master of the college actually called my mother and said, uh, your son is one of the most uh, articulate people in on the campus and we really like him. But, you know, um, he broke some rules, so we're throwing him out. But we want to give him a job on the bar for a year so he, <laughs> so he can get back in a year from now. And uh, you did? And I did, yeah. So was it the first job in the period of your life or you worked any, anywhere else? Uh, on, I worked only in summer jobs, you know, like I, I, I was a very shy kid until I was 14, 15, and I got a summer job, uh, which involved me calling the bingo numbers on the bingo with a microphone. And, uh, I was forced to not be shy very quickly. And that made me less shy. And that's probably a big contributor to how, how I evolved. Understand. So then you graduated and you said you were briefly went uh, for a PhD, right? And I didn't finish my PhD. Uh, my PhD was on um, the history of uh, the communist movement in Europe, <laughs> uh, particularly the evolution of communism into Euro-communism in France and in Italy, um, which is a form of nationalism. It's a kind of a weird thing, but communism became nationalist mainly due to Stalin. Stalin was all about this concept called socialism in one country, Russia. And, um, you know, if you've ever read Marx, that's an impossible idea. There, there could never, ever be socialism in one country. So Stalin was not a Marxist. He was a Stalinist. And I was, I hated Stalinism. I hated the Soviet bloc, uh, but I hated capitalism as well. So... um What I did is I gravitated towards uh, uh, a guy called Leon Trotsky. Leon Trotsky was the critic of Stalin, but still a communist uh, in the real sense, not a Stalinist, a proper communist. And um, 
I uh, did my thesis on how the communist parties were no longer communist, basically. Uh, they were basically becoming social democratic European labor type parties. And nationalism was their core ideology, which I, I hate. I hate nationalism. Um, I hate all nationalisms that are like oppressive nationalisms. I don't mind nationalism when it's uh, like, let's say, Nelson Mandela when he's oppressed and he's fighting for freedom. But the nationalism of big nations, not good. How did you move from this rebel, almost academic guy towards building uh, companies? What was the transition? And by um, the way, you, you said you didn't like capitalism, and here we go. I know I am one, yeah, but it doesn't mean I like it. Um, <laughs> it's like people in the Soviet Union... Uh, it probably had to do jobs and work according to the rules, but it doesn't mean they like it. Um, so, so I, uh, my, my transition was very easy. The first thing is I learned to code. Uh, in my early 20s, I learned to code. And I learned to code because um, it was exciting. There was computers suddenly were available for consumers to buy. And um, I was doing political campaigns. And if you could code you could automate campaigns like money raising, for example, and email uh, campaigns. So it was like before, many, many years before MailChimp, we were doing MailChimp. Mm. And um, so I learned to code. And, and as I learned to code, friends began to say to me, could you help me with this or could you help me do that? And this was in the late 70s, early 80s. By 1985-86, I had a company that did databases and networks for enterprises. What was the name of the company? And then it was called Brent Computer Services. Today, that company still exists. It's called Clarkswell. Is it the one that converted on Seascape? Or is yeah, it yeah, it became Seascape and then Clarkswell. It's had many lives. It's never yeah. died, basically. It still exists from the late early 80s all the way through to today. Yeah, I started making money from doing tech, um, which I used to pay myself so that I could be pretty much a full-time political activist. <laughs> um, this is my son calling us. Let's let's take it and we'll, he can be live. Hey, Liam, I'm being interviewed downstairs in my office and you're in the middle of the interview, so I can't talk to you. <laughs> I, I don't have any code. I'm sitting at a microphone with a guy who's recording me, so we can't. Uh, I can't help you. You're going to have to find another way. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Yeah, that was Liam, who was a rapper. Check out SoundCloud for um, his SoundCloud name is Lil L I L Backwood. Oh, Lil, another Lil. Good. Lil, Lil Backwood. <laughs> Let's go back to what we know as a, a seascape. I mean, you basically were making money for your political activism. Well, for so that I didn't have to get a job. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I could write and uh, I, I wrote books. I uh, wrote pamphlets. Uh, we published a weekly newspaper and a monthly magazine. Uh, I did all kinds of stuff like that. And the way you can do that if you want to also live is you need a source of income. So my source of income was tech. So you were making money not for the sake of money, but just for supporting your hobbies yeah. and your views. Yeah. That's interesting. And then you decided to sell the company. Yeah, so well, so what happened is, by about 1993, that company was doing quite well. It was me and my brother, um, but we 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 thought we were going to lose our biggest client because uh, they merged with another company, and we didn't think they would need us anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be a big minus to our revenue. So I said to my brother, you know, this is a good moment for you to take over because there'll be enough revenue for you, but not for both of us. Mm. Uh, and I've discovered this new thing called the internet, and I'm kind of interested in it. If you'll pay me for six months, uh, you can have all the shares in the other company. And um, he said yes. And I went off, and in 1994, I created EasyNet. And EasyNet was um, the first internet service provider in Europe that was for consumers. There were, there were some academic ISPs already, but there was no consumer ISP. And um, the, 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 um, the timing couldn't have been better. It was August 94, we took our first customer. Uh, we imagined the idea in, only in June 94. So we went from idea to opening in two months. 
And um, a year later, we were the launch partner for Windows 95. Oh, oh, oh that's the, um, and, quite a and, bit and, of And then three months after that, we did an IPO. So, and it's just fortunate timing. I mean, that's the one of the things about the speed of growth is all to do with timing. And you didn't raise any money then, right? For, for we couldn't. Money. We couldn't raise money. There was no venture capital in the UK. And, and you know, the UK is uh, one of the symptoms of the class system there is regional accents um, are very, are very um, well-defined. So when you talk to a venture capitalist, they, they know where you're from. Can uh, you fake it? No. Okay. It's impossible. Yeah. So we couldn't raise venture capital, A, because there wasn't any, and B, we were the wrong people anyway, in quotes. So we grew from revenue and did an IPO. That's how we did it. So it's even better. Basically, you took the circumstances as they are and benefited tremendously. Yeah. Yep. And company was pretty big, right, when it went, went public. Didn't it reach a billion or something ridiculous? It, it, well, we went public in 96, and it reached 660 million pounds in 90, late 99, early 2000. Gosh. Which was more than a billion dollars at that time. And, 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 then, and then it was sold. So you, you ran the company for some time. How would you com- compare running public company versus private? Actually, it was terrible. I, I, it's the reason I left. Um, I left EasyNet actually in 97. <clears throat> and I moved here to the United States uh, to do another company called Real Names. And the reason I left is um, once EasyNet was a public company, the board of directors were all external. Mm-hmm. Um, and they really didn't understand the opportunity at all. Um, e- EasyNet and Siberia Cafe were sister companies. We did them together. We, we were the, the hub in London for the entire internet. Um, Mick Jagger and Morris Saatchi were investors in Siberia. Oh, is it Saatchi Saatchi? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and literally, we were the center of the world of the internet in London at that time. A little bit like Wired was here in the US. Um, and we, everybody with an idea came to us. And we, we, we could have been the investors in everything. Mm. But the board of a public company is not interested in that. But I was personally. So I, I resigned in 97 and came to the US to do a different idea. And that idea was, you said, uh, real, names. real Names. Tell us a little bit about Real Names. Uh, real Names was um, a, li- a little bit like EasyNet was good timing in terms of internet service. Real Names was the first time that f- character sets in languages other than English could be used as web addresses. So the internet already by 97 was very globalized. Uh, but you couldn't use Chinese or Japanese or Cyrillic or Korean or Hebrew or Arabic, um, or, you know, uh, uh, or even accented European characters. You couldn't use them in a web address. So the internet was basically Latin character based at the web address layer. So ju- just as um, Tim Berners-Lee created a URL which pointed to a web page, we said, well, what if we could put on top of the URL, we could put a keyword in your own language? Mm-hmm. So instead of typing in the URL, you just would have to type in the keyword. So in China, you could type Wall Street Journal in Chinese um, with the spaces, and it would go to the correct URL. So obviously on a website, there are hundreds of URLs on a single website. There's a URL for every page. And if you're a product company, you know, like let's say a car company, Mm -hmm. there's a page for every part of the car. Um, So we gave keywords for pages. And so you might buy one domain name like Ford.com, but you would buy thousands of keywords from us. You are making so much money based on from what I'm hearing right now. It's like Google AdWords almost. Oh well, we we were before Google. We we yeah. invented AdWords. Uh, Larry and Sergey were my partners. They put real names inside Google, and they called it "I'm feeling lucky." <sighs> um, and we we taught the whole world the the value of keywords. That's insane. Yeah. And I'm assuming this was a very successful venture. I didn't check the numbers. But from what you're saying right now, I can kind of 
do like simple common sense math and yeah. it sounds like something ridiculous. Well, like by 2002, which was now five years later, we were sending a billion people to a web page using a keyword every 90 days, uh, which at that time was bigger than Google's traffic. So we, we were very big, but um, we made, a, we made a, f a, a huge mistake. We partnered with Microsoft. Mm. And the, at that time, the Microsoft browser was called Internet Explorer, had a 98% market share worldwide. That's why we partnered with them. And that meant that our keywords worked everywhere in the world. You would just type them in the browser and go to a web page, and there would be no search results. So you could type anything that was a specific thing, and it would go to that web page, no search results. Hmm. So our, our, what we used to say is don't search, just go there. Oh. Uh, and um, obviously Google hated that. But what we didn't know is Microsoft were very jealous of Google. Microsoft secretly wanted to be a search engine. So we became a problem for them because with us, you didn't need a search engine. You could just go right to the page. So in 2002, they told us they were going to turn us off and build their own search engine, which today is called Bing. Bing. And uh, we said, well, look, that's crazy. You, you're never going to be able to beat Google at search, but you don't have to. You've got every language in the world, and you've got every keyword in every language in the world that has a, a destination. Why do you need to have a search engine? It's way better to beat Google than to compete with Google. And they, they didn't get it, and uh, they turned us off, and the real names died. Just overnight? Overnight. Having, after, wow. well, not overnight. It took six months. But, yeah, but um, after having raised $130 million of venture capital and filed for a $1.5 billion IPO in 99, um, killed the whole company. Wow, that, that's very interesting. So how would you compare running the company in the UK and the company, running the company in the United States? Um, well, obviously the... The, the mechanics of running a company are very similar. The challenges are very similar. The U.S. gives you, and it's not just the U.S., it's really Silicon Valley, it gives you a marketing advantage mm -hmm. because if you create a, a fundamental idea in Silicon Valley, the world assumes that you are likely to be successful. Whereas if you do the exactly same company in London, the world will assume you will not be successful. It's mentality, right? So, yeah, so Silicon Valley has a marketing advantage. But other than that, I think it's pretty much the same. And I think that marketing advantage is declining uh, mainly through the rise of mobile and the cloud. Um, almost everywhere on the earth now is a place where you could build a big startup that was global. Um, so there's, the, 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 you know, you still need money, you still need skills. But, you know, if you, if you, and mostly the only missing ingredient You know, if you go to Krakow in Poland, for example, the only missing ingredient is money. Everything else is there. So uh, Estonia, you know, where Skype came out of, the, the missing mm -hmm. ingredient was money. So I think um, the world's becoming much less Silicon Valley centric and there's more opportunity in more places. That said, there's a lot more venture capital in Silicon Valley than anywhere else. So after real names... You uh, started Archimedes Labs? Yeah, that, that was almost immediately afterwards. Um, in uh, 2005, we started Archimedes Labs. That was myself and Michael Arrington. Mm -hmm. Michael had worked with me at Real Names. He was um, general counsel for a while and head of business development for quite a while. He was very good at his job. And um, when Real Names closed down, we, he did something else. We went our separate ways for two or three years, but we came back together in 2005 and formed Archimedes Ventures, it was called initially. And what was Archimedes do? We, 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 we were an incubator stroke accelerator. That is to say, we developed our own ideas, mm -hmm. incubation, and acceleration worked with other companies uh, to help them achieve their goals. Uh, very hands-on. Um, Uh, not really an investor, but we did we did some investing. Um, more of a hands-on um, helper, let's say, a mentor. 
And then we got equity in return for um, successful outcomes. Uh, we have we have a, a particular we had a particular structure called a triggered warrant, and a triggered warrant is um, we don't want anything up front. Don't pay us. Don't give us equity. But let's agree on some goals. Mm-hmm. And if we get to those goals, then that triggers some warrants that we can own in the company. So in that way, we're very aligned with the founded, founding team on the outcome. Uh, if, if they lose, we lose. If they win, we win. And what are some examples of companies you guys incubated in our communities? Well, the first two were TechCrunch and um, Edgeo. Edgeo got sold to Naval Ravikant, who now runs AngelList, uh, after a couple of years and didn't do well. It, it was a big, audacious idea, but it just didn't work out. TechCrunch was, was Michael's idea, um, and it obviously did very well. And um, uh, those are the only two we did between 2005 and 2010. We only did those two. So it was 100% incubation in those, mm-hmm. in those first five years. Once we once TechCrunch was sold to AOL in 2010, Michael then went his own way because he had to stay working at TechCrunch. I never worked at TechCrunch. He he was the only one who worked there, and um, uh, I I changed the name from Archimedes Ventures to Archimedes Labs at that point, and then we started doing accelerations. So we did um, we did um, the ones that would be the most well known would be Quixi, which Alibaba invested in. Mm-hmm. That went up to about six hundred million in valuation, and um, we also did. Um, I'm going to forget the name now, but it's uh, it's uh, uh, it was a mobile web development company out of Slovakia that that GoDaddy acquired for forty million after nine months. Um, uh, those were the two most well known. It's a good deal. Yeah, that's nice. And a little bit about TechCrunch. So uh, you said you weren't uh, really involved in that. Was Michael primarily? I, I was Michael's, you know, friend and thought partner. Mm-hmm. And um, because <clears throat> because it was created inside the Archimedes structure, mm-hmm. it was owned by Archimedes initially. Um, so you know, I I was the majority shareholder in Archimedes. Um, so there was a moment at which I was also the majority shareholder at TechCrunch. But it was very much because it was an Archimedes vehicle, and everything me and Michael did, we did through Archimedes. Mm-hmm. So um, not only was it his thing, I was not particularly favorable to us doing it. Ah. Uh, I thought it was too small an idea for his talent. And that he could do much, something much bigger uh, because a blog can only scale to a certain place. He, he vastly exceeded my expectations, but it was still a small idea. It exited for a number that, after five years' work, you know, is not a not a huge number, but it's big enough to have set Michael up for the rest of his life. So he's very happy, and and he deserves all the congratulations he gets. And I definitely don't take any of the credit. Uh, other than um, probably as his mentor and advisor. How do you rate TechCrunch now? Like, do you use it? Uh, I read it, yeah. You read it? yeah. And, you? and my wife, uh, Crunchbase is now a separate country, company, but my, my wife works at Crunchbase. Not nice. What has happened since then? Well, um, it's interesting. Between 2010 and 2014, um, I invested about a million dollars through Archimedes Labs and ended up with um, returning uh, 200% to my investors in cash two years in and about 1,200% in stock value. So we took a million dollars and multiplied it by 14 in about two and a half years. Nice return. in, In value terms. And I thought, you know, I like this and I'm not terrible at it. So I'm going to do more. And in 2014, decided to try to raise a fund, a larger fund. Um, initially 25 million and it proved incredibly hard to raise. It's interesting, but Silicon Valley sees me as an entrepreneur. And there's a big difference between an entrepreneur and an investor. 
and the people who give money to investors are not the same people who give money to entrepreneurs. So when the investor funders looked at me, I, don't, I didn't look like the kind of person they normally give money to. So it was incredibly hard to break free of your classification. Um, so the second problem was 25 million is both, uh, it's too big a number for friends and it's too small a number for institutions. So it's, it's, it was, comp after about a year, I realized it was stupid to even try to raise 25 million. It was the wrong, the wrong number. And I was the wrong person to raise that number. So I, I had two choices, go smaller. So friends could do it or go bigger. So I chose to go bigger. And then this has never been publicized, but I went to China in uh, 2015 with a friend whose name is Veronica Wu. Uh, she was then running Tesla in China at that point. Mm. And um, we successfully raised um, almost a billion dollars from a single Chinese investor to address the funding gap between the seed and growth stages here in Silicon Valley. Our strategy was going to be to invest in the top micro funds in the valley um, and then to directly invest in the best companies that come out of those micro funds. Uh, so the, exactly the ADV idea. Um, 2015, we succeeded, we got agreement and money was raised. And at the very end of the process, um, Veronica decided in her wisdom that she didn't want me involved in it. Ah. Um, oh, yeah. When you raise billion dollars, you probably start thinking a little differently, I guess. You know, I think she was just more comfortable working with people she knew better than me. And um, even though it was my idea and I'd set the whole thing up and she'd left Tesla because of the idea, she became the primary um, principal because it was a Chinese investor who spoke Chinese, not English. She was much more comfortable to him. Go to person, yeah. And she didn't want uh, me involved for whatever reason. It's fine. So at the end of 2015, there I was thinking, what shall I do next? Because I was no longer involved in that. It's, today it's called Hone Capital, H-O-N-E, and it's on University Avenue. And Veronica and I are still friends. You know, these things, these things happen. Um, so I said, um, you know, what will I do next? And Lee Strafford, my co-founder at ADV, called me. And I said, well, it's funny you should call because I now know why there's this problem in venture to do with this funding gap between seed and growth. And I think it's big in the UK as well. And we ended up collaborating on doing it in the UK. So it was your idea for, or for ADV? My, well, my idea and Lee's idea and the other founders have kind of converged after three years into probably a slightly different idea than we started with. But I started with, um, you, uh, a few things. Number one, mobile has created the possibility of big outcomes everywhere in the world. So the UK is a big outcome place with billion dollar companies being created every year. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, the seed f uh, funds that invest in the companies early don't have enough capital to follow through on their investments. Therefore, they get diluted and end up not making very much from their investments. Uh, so if we could supply capital into that early stage that would allow it to cross the bridge into the growth stage, we can end up owning a reasonably high percent of all the winning companies. That's the that was my original idea. And it turned out to be true, right? And who do you typically compete for for the deals? Like, it seems like you're in a niche, but yeah, we, all the niches have some sort of sort of competition, right? Well, it it changes through the life of the company. So we we don't compete in the very early stage because we let our partners do the initial investments. Mm -hmm. So we're not looking for seed pre seed, and mostly not even seed, but definitely not pre seed. Uh, at the seed stage, we are looking for the companies they miss. So if, if they're already in a company, we'll never compete for that deal. Mm -hmm. We'll let them do it. We're looking for the ones they miss. Then, um, you know, then there's a portfolio or a cohort uh, at the seed stage. Some of them are our direct investments, but most of them are our partners' investments. We then provide capital as the new rounds occur to help our partners who are, don't have enough cash to do those f events themselves. We, we, we give them, we call it pro rata drawdown. Mm -hmm. We supply 100% of the capital, but we give them 50% of the profits. 
So it's an easy good deal. It's yeah, it's an easy good deal. Uh, so we're not competing there. Where we really compete is when you get to um, probably a, a, an A or a B round, and some of the bigger Sandhill Road style investors now get interested. Well, in the past they would have had an easy an easy entry into the companies because there was no competition. But now we're already in these companies, and we do have enough money to write the bigger checks. So, so we really compete there with um, the people like Index and Axel and uh, Balderton and, and others. Um, uh, that's mo- most likely where competition will be. And then even later, still, you know, once they become several hundred million valuations, our investors, legal and general, they have a trillion pounds under management they can write much bigger checks um, and they compete with the likes of Fidelity. I start seeing them and venture deals more often. Them, Willington and some other traditional mutual fund companies start jumping in VC deals, which yeah. is surprising to me. Yeah. So how has this world of tech and VC changed over your career, Like, oh, which is more than 30 years, right? Yeah, four, four decades, I always say. 80s, 90s, 2000s and now this current decade. So the biggest change of all depends on your geographical vantage point. So if you're looking at it from London, the biggest change is you went from no venture capital to venture capital um, around about the early 2000s to now seed venture and growth as three distinct asset classes in venture and the most well-funded are seed and growth today that's that's the evolution if you look at it from silicon valley you went from lots of venture capital in in the 90s to none in the early 2000s after the bubble burst to a whole new class of investors around 2005 through 2010 which are the micro funds the accelerators and the incubators and today you end up with lots of seed lots of growth and not much venture which is the same as london so even though they were completely different, they've now converged to where they're very similar. The only difference really is scale. Silicon Valley is about four Londons uh, or four UKs. Uh, but, you know, America's 300 million people and UK is 65 million. So that's about right. So uh, you mentioned microfunds, which is about less than 100 million. Back in the day, wasn't 100 million is quite big of a fund for VC? Or it's always been a little sl- uh, small? It was, it was always small. I mean... You know, my first my first investor was Draper Fisher Jurvetson. Yeah. Um, along with Ideal Lab, they put I think if my memory serves me right, five million into real names in the A round. And in those days, the A round was the first round. There was no such thing as seed. It didn't exist. So the A round was um, five million, and that was uh, coming out of a fund that was roughly a hundred million. And so they would make. I don't know, 10, 15, 20 investments out of a fund and then raise another fund. That was normal then. Uh, today, that same 100 million fund is doing deals where the first check they write is possibly under a million dollars. Um, so they're doing a lot more deals. They're not doing 20 deals. They're, they're out of a $100 million fund, you're doing a lot more deals. With so much capital out there and so many funds... Do you think the valuations go a little higher than they should, or maybe entrepreneur change a bit because they focused more on growth and less on the bottom line? Um, well, you, you you definitely don't want entrepreneurs at the early stage focusing on the bottom line. That would create all the wrong behaviors. Um, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but in the early life of a company, you're not focused on revenue. Uh, you're focused on product market fit. Mm-hmm. And if you try to drive revenue before you have product market fit, you, you won't succeed anyway. Um, and you can do growth hacking to fake it, but everyone will see through that as a fake. So you really need to not be focused on the bottom line. You need to be focused on the long-term vision. What, you know, when Reed, when Reed Hastings built Netflix, he focused on how many people in the world have a DVD player in their home. And how could he get 100% of them to pay for his service? He didn't focus on next month's revenue. Next month's revenue, of course, is always important. I'm not saying it isn't, but it's not the focus. That's your operating detail right there. 
But, but if you don't put your operating detail in the context of a big outcome that you can enumerate and go after, you probably haven't got a, a, a good idea and you're probably not a good leader. I worry about Silicon Valley today because, you know, YC, you know, old Sam Altman there is teaching people to pitch traction. Not because he believes in it, by the way. I think Sam's way smarter than that. But he thinks the investor's looking for it. Well, they are, but they're wrong. You don't want those investors. You want investors who are prepared to go along with you on a big idea. Um, the ones who are looking for short-term traction are going to mess with your mind and make you do all the wrong things. But do you think it's the, the reason for that is the probably comes back to the life of the fund, comes back to the LP's expectation and... Uh, Not because necessarily because the VCs don't realize yeah. what happens. Yeah, I think it's the structure. When you have a 10-year fund and LPs, and you've got to give returns in a certain period of time, the incentives are all misaligned. They're not aligned at all. So the business model of venture that no longer fits the reality of company formation. And that's a problem. And that's what you address with ADV. Yeah. Over the years, you also met a lot of business leaders, tech leaders, and uh, VC investors alike. I'm wondering which one of them you actually admire the most. I mean, I'm sure you've admired a lot of them. Yeah. A lot of very fascinating people here. But who kind of stick to your mind? Well, the best investor I've ever had is Ron Conway. Ron is very, very unusual because he actually delivers more value than he promises. Mm. he will return an email in less than a minute and he will make introductions that you ask for from his huge, you know, um, contact list. Um, and he kind of has the ability to somehow fractionalize his attention to you for as long as it needs to deal with your next need. And, and he's very responsive. I've just never met anyone like that. So he really stands out. Um, You know, people like Michael Arrington, uh, me and Michael have had our fights because that's in his nature and uh, to, to be a fighter. But it's what, he, what he's awesome at is um, being persistent around his beliefs and not letting a very large amount of pushback knock him off his course. He's, he's relentless. Um, and I think that relentless character serves him really really well and um, sometimes it means you fight with him but it's not because he hates you it's because he believes in something and that's that's what he should do um so you know i, I john fisher at draper fisher jervison he was on my board for five years he never ever tried to second guess me he always tried to support my intuition and help me deliver on it And he was just, for somebody coming from the UK, first time in the Valley, didn't know anybody, he couldn't, he was probably the best mentor I had at that time. Um, along with a guy called Bob Korzanuski, who was the chief financial officer of Verisign, uh, who were an investor in real names. Oh, Verisign is a fascinating company, by the way. Yeah. So, you know, lots of people I, I can think of that uh, I admire. So I have a little quick blitz here. I would just ask you a, a brief question and you just give me a brief answer. So what's your favorite movie? My favorite movie, probably Star Wars, anyone. <laughs> favorite movie star? Favorite movie star, Meryl Streep. Favorite singer or a band? Mm, favorite singer or a band, Elkie Brooks and Vinegar Joe. Go and check that out on Google. I should. Favorite song? Favorite song, We Are the Champions. Oh, Queen? Yeah. Favorite book? Das Kapital, Karl Marx. <laughs> That's unexpected. Favorite sports to watch? Football, as in soccer. A favorite place in the Bay Area? Stinson Beach. Favorite country to visit? Mm, South Africa. South Africa. My wife's South African. Oh, she speaks Afrikaans? She does, actually, yeah. That's fascinating. A favorite historical figure? Darwin. Uh, what's the first item on your bucket list? I don't have a bucket list. I speak to so many successful people, and none of you guys have a bucket list. It's interesting. Why do we have it? I kind of live in the moment. You know, I, I hate 
I hate things disconnected from the present, and I hate thinking in the past. So I very much think in the near future as it relates to the present. And so bucket list is almost too detached from that. Um, and it's also too self-centered. I don't really think about what I do, actually. I think about what needs to be done, which is not the same as what I do. I'll, I'll, I then work on whatever that thing is. That's an interesting philosophy. What's your favorite quote? My favorite quote? Uh, my favorite quote is probably... Um, The productive forces of mankind are held back by the social relations of production. And that's from Karl Marx. And what it, ba <laughs> what it basically means in the modern context, you would interpret it as um, the human race is increasingly global economically, but social level, we live through nation states, and those nation states hold back our globalized human tendencies. So you've built two... Uh billion dollar companies you've raised a billion dollar in funds and you've been involved in venture capital and entrepreneurship your entire life and Karl Marx is a person you influence by so much I would never guess that well you know why it's because he was um, it isn't anything specific he believed in actually it's his methodology of thinking he was what's called a historical thinker That is to say, he knew that nothing, the only constant is change. And um, therefore, he never looked at the present as an end point. He only looked at the present as the starting point for what's next. So he's influential because he forces you to think um, in, in this liquid way about the near future. Um, and that's based on a German philosopher called Hegel. Hegel, Hegel who, who was the second person to use dialectics. And dialectics means the opposition of things that lead to a new thing. Um, and so disruption in tech, challenging an old way of doing things, is a great example of dialectics. And what emerges, like, say, Salesforce.com emerging out of Oracle, mm -hmm. and, um, that's a great example of it. So the reason I like Marx is, as a philosopher, he forces you never to accept that you've reached, society's reached an end point. It's always just at the beginning point of what comes next. And that gives you the inspiration to wake up every day and figure it out. So I have a final question for you. What life advice would you pass down to young people today? You know, it, it, that's very hard because there's so many different types of people I, you know you could classify people as on a spectrum entitled all the way through to deprived and the life advice is going to be different depending on where you are on that spectrum if you're entitled you know don't be how do you know that you're entitled i don't think people realize that it means you assume the world is there for you and you get angry with the world if it doesn't deliver your expectations and you don't take upon yourself to make the things you want to happen happen you you just get angry if they don't so you're a passive recipient of things not an active agent making things happen and entitlement is usually very passive passive aggressive sometimes mm -hmm. whereas um, deprived you know often you become insecure and you feel like you are the victim of the world well don't be a victim be a, a change agent Make the world like you want it to be. Don't be the victim of the way it is. And you can help both ends of the spectrum to eventually become the same thing, which is a belief that they can inf influence what happens next based on what they do. Thank you, Keith. Very nice having you on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you for listening to The Accent Podcast. For more episodes, please visit theaccentpodcast.com. Until next time. <laughs>